privilege of coming before you to give you worship and praise and honor and glory that you so richly deserve. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of hearing your word this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and unlock those doors of our hearts that need to be unlocked, that your word may come in and take deep root in us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, several years ago, uh, we vacationed on Seabrook Island in South Carolina. Now, a little known fact is that Mary's great, 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 great something grandfather was Captain Seabrook. And he owned that island and considered it an absolute wasteland out on the coast where nobody could get to. It's worthless. So he gave it to the Episcopal Church. Well, in the 1920s, everybody considered it an absolute wasteland before air conditioning and all that stuff and, and uh, mosquitoes out there. So they sold most of it off and just left a little bit for a camp. Of course, now it's worth tens of billions of dollars. So we got to... Um, go out on vacation on Mary's great, 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 great grandfather's island. And we didn't get to go to one of the nice places on the beach. We were like on the, on the marsh side somewhere. But it was a great time. We, we went uh, crabbing. Mary taught me to go shrimping because she as a kid knew how to do that in Charleston. You know, throw out the net and bring them in. And that was a lot of fun. And we went swimming. Um, but after a while, you know, we got, uh, you know, sunburned and all that. So we decided to go visit her Aunt Alma on John's Island. Now, John's Island is not a barrier island, so it's not one of the beach islands, and it's not the mainland, it's sort of in between, so it's a sort of a marsh area, tidal creek area, with very rich sandy loam, a great place to do farming. And there's a little bit of salt in, in the soil as well. So Mary tells me, I'm not a big tomato eater, but Mary, she can have a tomato and, and a mayonnaise sandwich. Anyone know about those? Okay, not me, but Mary knows about those, okay? So she, anyway, she says that the John's Island tomato is the best tomato in the world. And I believe her. So anyway, we had, we had driven uh, onto John's Island, and but on the way there, on the way to, to Ma Aunt Alma's house, there was this field, about 10 acre field, uh, strewn with these yellow cylindrical objects. And I thought they were first corn cobs that were left over from the winter harvest that were sitting out there, but they were sort of the wrong size and they were too big around and they were smooth. So I didn't really know what they were. So when we got to Aunt Alma's house, um, I asked her what these corn cob like objects were out in the field. And she said in her very island accent, and I can't even try to do it, but she said, honey, those are cucumbers rotting on the vine. They can't get no one to pick them. Oh, wasn't that sad? Ten acres. And so the migrant workers had already come through that part of South Carolina. They were already up in North Carolina. They were working their way north as the crops were being harvested. And so every time I drove by that field, it just about made me sick. I mean, it's just sad to think about, you know, the, the plowing and the fertilizer and the weeding and the watering and and that whole crop just going to waste, rotting on the vine. And the memory of those cucumbers, ready for harvest and yet rotting on the vine, reminds me of what Jesus said in this morning's gospel reading from Luke chapter 10. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Tragically, there are not enough laborers to bring in God's harvest, that is, those who are ready to be brought to Him. Those who might not be ready a week from now, but right now, they are ready to hear the Lord's Word. They are aware that they need God's help. They are ready. And there's just not enough laborers to bring in all those who are ready and willing to come to the Lord right now. So right here in the Mid-South, there is a much more valuable crop than cucumbers or grain that is going unharvested. 
This great unharvested crop are the precious souls of those whom the Holy Spirit has been working on for years. He's been preparing their hearts. Believers have planted God's Word in one way or another in their hearts. And some of these people don't even remember when it was planted there. But, but seeds of hope were, were planted there many years ago. And the Holy Spirit has been watering the seeds of God's Word in their hearts. And faithful Christians have been, been weeding out the weeds of deception from their lives. And, and the harvest is ready. And, and, and they long to be harvested. But they don't even know what it is. They long to be brought in, but they don't know to what. So right this moment, they've come to the realization that they're in bondage to their sins. They may not even articulate it as sin, but they realize they're in bondage. They, they long for freedom from that captivity they're in. They need someone to help them to be freed, but they can't do it on their own, and they're not even sure what it is. And yet no one has told them what it is. That it's the gospel of the kingdom of God, of Jesus Christ. They're ready. They're willing. So brothers and sisters in Christ, don't let them wither and rot in the field. Bring them in. Go out into God's harvest field and bring them into the barn of God's church. As Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. It is. But the laborers are few. Now, crops don't magically blow, blow into the barn, do they? Wouldn't that be great if you were a farmer? You know, you, you, you did all the soybeans, all the cotton, and you said, okay, it's harvest time. Open the, do board, door, the, the doors to the barn. Here it comes. It's just going to blow right in. Wouldn't that be great? Is that how it works? What happens? You have to send laborers out into the harvest field, right? It, it's work. It's work. And people who are ready to receive the Lord don't magically blow in the doors of the church. Laborers, guess who that is? Go ahead, point at your neighbor. <laughs> and then point at yourself. <laughs> Laborers have to go out the doors and bring those people who are ready for harvest into the barn of God's church. So the question is, who and what? Okay, who? Back in Luke chapter 6, we're in Luke chapter 10 this morning. In Luke, back in Luke chapter 6, Jesus spent the entire night praying. And then in the morning, he appointed 12 apostles to be apostles. So clearly, the 12 apostles were clergy set apart to be ordained leaders in the church. Now, they were to disciple others to preach and teach and celebrate the sacraments and to be the primary leaders in the church. Now in today's reading, four chapters later in Luke chapter 10, Jesus appointed, do you remember how many? 72, 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two in every town and place where he himself was about to go. Now, I believe that these 72, it doesn't really name it, but I believe these 72 were not clergy, but they were the lay members of the church. And he appointed them to go out. So Jesus appointed them and sent them ahead of himself and his apostles into every town and place where Jesus himself was about to go. So the parallel for today is that Jesus appoints and sends you ahead of himself and ahead of the clergy into every place imaginable. Schools and shops and construction sites and offices and warehouses and, and neighborhoods. He sends you into every place in which he himself is about to go. Now you might say, well, I, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm ready to be sent. You know, I, I, I don't have a seminary education. I don't know what to say. I'm not exactly sure with whom to speak. But let me assure you, you don't need a seminary education. You don't need to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to have a big old black Bible under your arm and knock on doors or ring doorbells and, and scare people. You don't have to do that. Let me assure you that, um, that you just need to go out, even though you're not perfectly ready, neither am I, just go out 
and, and help bring in that harvest of souls. Because if you don't, and I don't, if all of us don't, tomorrow or the next day or next week, they may not be ready anymore. That, that window of opportunity in their heart and in their lives may have closed shut. So, and they may never be brought into the barn of God's church. They may never have eternal salvation. So what should you do? Well, let's take a look at five things that's listed in your, in your bulletin. Five things from Luke chapter 10 that Jesus told us to do. And I'm going to summarize them like this. Engage in team ministry. Pray earnestly. Expect resistance. Be content with what God has provided. And heal the sick and proclaim the gospel. So number one, engage in team ministry. Now, anyone know how many disciples Jesus had? Twelve. Twelve. Okay, we immediately hear twelve, right? Because that's what we think. Because of the twelve apostles, right? And yet, today, he sent out how many more? Seventy-two. So even though we traditionally think of there being twelve disciples or twelve apostles, clearly, there's a lot more disciples, including anyone here who is a follower of Jesus. So there were 72 others that Jesus uh, sent out. Now, he didn't have 71 or 73. He had 72. How did he send them out? Two by two. two, by two. Okay. So he had 72, so there would be this pairing, sent them out, because biblical ministry is not solo ministry. Two by two. Jesus always sent his disciples out two by two. And the same is true today. Teaching Sunday school, two by two. Doing youth and children's ministry, good, you're catching on. Leading a grow group, two by two. Inviting those outside the church into your heart and into your home, two by two. We do this as a team. There is no such thing as solo ministry within the church. So in, in this church, there are some who are engaging in solo ministry because someone has not come alongside them to help teach or to help do the ministry. So possibly, God has had you in this church for a while, and, and it's time for you to step forward, to say, I'll be part of that two by two. I, I'd like to help. I'd like to be part of the team. Number two, pray earnestly. In verse two, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, because the harvest is plentiful and because the laborers are few, therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into His harvest. Now in verse 1, we've already heard about the 72, and immediately He's saying to pray for the laborers. Who are the laborers? The 72. So spend time praying earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Plead with Him to send you and others into this great harvest of souls that's out there. Plead with the Lord to show you who is ready. Not everybody's ready. But plead with the Lord to show you who is ready. Who's ready to receive the good news of God's kingdom. And then plead with the Lord to soften their hearts and open your lips. And plead with the Lord to send you into His harvest field so that He can bring, through, through you, He can bring others into His kingdom and into His church. Because there are no solo Christians. There's no Lone Ranger Christians out there saved but by themselves. They have to be within the tent of God's church. Because this is where they're nurtured. This is where, they're, where they receive the sacraments. This is where the body of Christ can help them grow up in the Lord. So, instead of praying that the harvest will just blow in the doors. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, please send more people to this church. Anyone ever prayed that? Okay, that is praying, Lord, blow that grain into the church, into the barn here. So, instead of praying that prayer, which we tend to want to do, pray earnestly that you and others will go out the doors. Say, Lord, help me to go out those doors into your harvest field. 
and pray earnestly that you and others will not think that they have fulfilled their religious duty by simply coming to church. Pray earnestly that you and others will take the time to engage with the gospel, others, and bring them into the community of faith. Now you notice I didn't say do these things. I said pray earnestly that we will do these things. Because I don't know about you, but I can't do this in my own strength. It's uncomfortable. It's unnatural. And yet, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do these things. That's why we pray how? Lack lackadaisically, did you say? Well, what did you say? Pray what? Earnestly. Okay, okay. I'm glad, glad, you, I'm glad I heard that. That's good. So to keep those who are longing for Jesus, but don't even know it yet. They know they're longing for Jesus, but they don't even know how to articulate His name yet. To keep them from rotting on the vine. Engage in team ministry and pray earnestly. Number three, expect resistance. Now who here likes resistance? If you're lifting weights, you like resistance, right? Okay. Well, I don't like resistance, but expect resistance. If you're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, expect resistance. Now, most Americans are shocked when they first say, okay, the preacher said I should go out and share my faith. So they go out and try it, and it's a disaster. It's like, well, Billy Graham tried it, and, and, and he did it. It seemed to work with him, but I, I must be doing something wrong because people didn't just fall down on their knees and say, yes, Jesus, I want you. No, they didn't do that. Well, if you think that you did something wrong if you got resistance, you didn't at all. If you aren't getting pushback, then, then you aren't doing something right. But if you are getting pushback, you're doing something right. You know, during World War II, uh, a bomber, when it was over its target, would get hit with flak. You ever heard of that? These, these flak guns or the anti-aircraft guns? They'd hit them with flak. And, and hence the saying, if you're not catching flak, you're not over the target. That's where that expression comes from. If you're not catching flak, you're not over the target. And if you are, as a Christian, catching a little flack for being a Christian, then you know you're hitting the target. You're, you're hitting the target, and, and, and it's, it's being fruitful in the lives of those around you. In 2 Timothy 3.12, Jesus said, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be, what do you think, blessed, happy, rich? What do you think? What's, what's the catchphrase there? Persecuted. Isn't that great? Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Doesn't that sound like fun? It's just part of the deal. I don't like it any more than you do, but it's just part of the deal. Now, in northern Nigeria, Christians expect resistance. They grow up, and the same with in, in communist China and, and in the former Soviet Union, people expected resistance. They knew it was part of the deal. In fact, I just read this week that in China, in the house church movement, that if you haven't been in, in prison for at least three years, they don't think you're qualified to be a pastor yet. I'm serious. And uh, they consider your time in prison like we consider seminary training. Because it's there that you learn to be faithful in the midst of adversity. Now in northern, northern Nigeria, Christians expect resistance. They know some will accept the Lord and they know the most will not. Um, but the Anglican church there is growing rapidly. Did you know that now there's the Roman Catholic Church, there's evangelical churches, and there's the Anglican Church there. But in Northern Africa, the Anglican Church alone is planting, on average, one church a day. Can you imagine? That's how fast the church is growing. And, um, and that's when they've had hundreds of churches burned in the last 10 years. Burned to the ground. And they're still planting more churches. They're not saying, oh, it's not safe. Let's get out of here. No, they're expecting resistance. And because of it, tens of thousands of people are going to come to know the Lord and have eternal life in Him because they were willing to accept the resistance. Now, if we expect the church in America to grow, and if we expect this particular church to grow, 
Expect resistance. Expect flack. Don't be surprised. In our reading from Luke chapter 10, verse 3, Jesus said, Go, on your, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of puppies. Is that right? Puppies sound like a lot more fun. Did he say, did Jesus really say wolves? Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Fluffy, fat, delicious lambs. That's you. And Jesus said, I'm going to send you out among wolves. Gee, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of how it feels, right? Because in, the, in America, we think that God sort of lives to make us happy and blessed and rich and all. But no. He says He sends us out as lambs among wolves. So expect resistance. That's part of normal Christianity. In verses 10 and 11, Jesus goes on to say, but whatever, whenever you enter a town and they, do, and they do not receive you, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Yeah, you might reject it, but the kingdom of God has actually come near to that person. And maybe a month later or a year later or ten years later, they will remember that and they will receive the Lord. Now, if your friends and family don't accept the Lord through your witness the first time or the second time or the tenth time, don't get upset. Don't quit. Don't be surprised. Expect resistance. And don't take it personally like I do sometimes. I mean, I really do. You know, it's like it hurts my feelings when, you know, I, I'm, I'm just talking to somebody and, and, you know, maybe trying to pray for them or they just, just totally reject it. But don't take it personally because it's not you they're rejecting. In verse 16 of today's reading, Jesus said, And the one who hears you hears me. And the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So when someone is hostile to the gospel that you might be sharing, it's not really you they're upset with. So try not to personalize it. Expect resistance, and above all, don't give up, don't shut up. Number four, be content with what God has provided. Now, in verses 7 and 8, Jesus said a curious thing. I always find it interesting when he says something that seems odd. He said, And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Now you'd think, you know, if you were visiting someplace for a week or two, it would be a lot fairer to sort of maybe spend a few nights here and a few nights there and so that you wouldn't be a burden to anyone. Um, but in the first century, you know, when you traveled somewhere, there weren't a lot of holiday inns at that time, I don't think. You know, or Hilton's or Quality Inns or anything like that. So, so the whole idea of hotels and restaurants was very, very different than what we imagine today. So typically you'd stay with a friend or a family member, maybe a fourth cousin, you know. Somebody, yeah, you're in the family tree, you know, and then they'd be obligated to provide hospitality for you. And um, you might even stay with, a, you know, with someone that you were doing business with. Um, but, you know, if you got into their house and you know, found that this fourth cousin that you had never met, and they sort of had a small house and they didn't have real fancy food, but you heard there was somebody down the street that really had a nice house and really had some really good lamb chops, you might just be tempted to go down there because they are richer. And they can provide richer this, that, and the other for you. So I think what God's telling us is not to be tempted by money, not to do our ministry with others, not to be motivated with our ministry for others if they're rich and well-connected or if they're poor and not connected. Share Jesus with poor and rich alike and equally invite poor and rich alike into your home. Equally invite all races into your home. Don't let money be a motivation 
in sharing the gospel. So to keep those who long for Jesus, don't even know it yet, and are withering on the vine right now, to keep them from withering and to bring them into God's kingdom, engage in team ministry. How? Two by two. Two by two. Team ministry. Pray earnestly. Expect resistance. Be content with what God has provided. And finally, number four, number five, heal the sick and proclaim the gospel. You know, wherever Christian ministry is, there's always going to be healing ministry. Because the ministry of Jesus was, was always integrated with healing ministry, and we must do the same. So in verse 9, Jesus told the 72, let's call them lay people, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, I've heard it said that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So when we start by caring for others, then eventually they'll care what we want to say to them. So if someone that you know is hurting, either physically or emotionally, you have an opportunity to bring the healing of Christ into their life. Simply say, may I pray for you? And maybe you're not used to praying out loud. Maybe you're not used to praying other people. But think about it like just say, may I pray for you? And if they say yes, follow up with another question. May I pray for you right now? And if they say no, and I've never had anyone say no, then you can say, great, I'll pray for you at home. I'll be praying for you. But if they say, yes, you may pray for me right now, and then follow up with a third question, say, well, may I, may I lay my hand on your shoulder? And just so you can be lay, laying hands on them. And if they say yes, then you lay hands on them, and then you just pray. And it doesn't have to be a fancy prayer. It can be something as simple as, Lord, bless my friend, bring healing to them, in Jesus' name, amen. It might be a longer prayer, but it doesn't have to be, okay? Just pray for them. And what you've done is if you, you have invited God into their heart. You have opened a door into their soul. You have opened a door for the Lord to enter in. And you have kept a door open.